You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. We're glad you're watching a Bible answer today. I'm Mike McDaniel, and I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. We have three gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. Hello, I'm Brent Arnold from the Greenfield Church of Christ in Greenfield, Tennessee. My name is Andy Brewer. I preach for the Phillip Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee. My name is Mike Peters. I'm the preacher at the Pottsville Church of Christ in Hickory, Kentucky. Wherever you may be watching a Bible answer today, we are glad. And we hope that you will tell other people in your area, friends and family, about this program, where you see it, and what time that you see it. We uh, have a good question here for Brother Peters. He will start us off today. Brother Peters, is it wrong to cheat in school in order to keep up your grade point average? Brother Peters. It is no doubt that we have all been there. You're sitting there at your desk. The teacher comes in, announces, clear off your desk, and starts passing out that test that you're not ready for. Oh, but I'm going to get in trouble if I get a bad grade. Surely I can just look over here and copy my neighbor's paper. No one will know. Surely that can't be wrong. Well, the end never justifies the means, and we need to understand that. And we need to understand what cheating really is. When that teacher passes out that test, she is wanting to know what you know. What information have you gained by sitting in her classroom and learning? Have you learned what you're supposed to have learned? And as we write our answers down on that paper and then put our name on it, we are telling her, this is what I know. Now, if we have cheated by whatever means, we ultimately are deceiving her. And when we look at cheating that way, well, the Bible has a lot to say about that. Ultimately, we're lying to her. We're saying, this is what I know, this is what I've learned from you, when really it isn't. Proverbs 12 and verse 22 says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are His delight. Paul says in Colossians 3 and verse 9, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. So it's a sinful thing when we cheat because ultimately we're lying. We're saying we know something when we really don't. There's an easy way to avoid the temptation of cheating, and that's simply by being prepared. Keep a good record and be organized of when those tests are going to be. Be prepared for them and continually go over that material. Don't wait till the night before, and that will help with the temptation to cheat. Uh, we need to remember that it is always better to be honest, to have integrity, to take that negative grade and the consequences that come with it, rather than cheating and ultimately lying and sinning against your teacher and against God. Thank you for that question. Brother Arnold, is it scriptural for one member to sue another member of a local church? Brother Arnold. Well, I, I'm assuming, uh, based off the word sue, that in this uh, situation we're talking about something that would be a civil case. Maybe it has to do with money or has to do with property or, or something of, of that nature. The reason I say that is because uh, I, I would think that uh, criminal cases would be handled differently from civil cases uh, in this matter. When a, a criminal offense has been uh, committed, uh, the law has to be executed and, and uh, there's nothing that should be done to stop that. In some cases, it, it may mean that the uh, protection of other innocent individuals will demand that the one be convicted of that crime and be, uh, be punished in the proper way. I say that because I have known of situations where, unfortunately, it was a criminal, uh, law, a criminal case that involved two Christians, and, and the one who was pursuing the execution of that law was criticized for, for doing that. 
Uh, the reason for doing so was simply the protection of other innocent individuals who might be harmed. But now let's, let's think more along the lines of a civil suit. Maybe there's a disagreement about a business or money or property or, or things of that nature and, and here are two Christians who disagree with one another over that matter and one has decided to settle the matter in court to sue the other individual over this matter. Well, the fact of the matter is there, there are a number of spiritual uh, uh, matters that are involved in this. Uh, first of all, Christians, if they possess the Spirit of Christ in the way that they should, would be those who, if they have wronged someone, they would be willing to take responsibility, responsibility for that. Confess your faults one to another, James 5 and verse 16 indicates. The Bible teaches in a number of places that repentance demands retribution. And so if we're really reflecting the Spirit of Christ the way we should, and if we realize we have wronged someone, we should be willing to make that right with them without having to take that to a, a, a legal type of situation, to a courtroom, so to speak. Uh, another, thing, another issue here is that as a Christian people, if we possess the Spirit of Christ, we should be a people who are merciful and willing to forgive. And uh, as such, it would not be necessary for us to seek our revenge in the court system. So I, I guess basically what I'm saying is, is that if it becomes necessary for these matters to be settled in court, then really what we're saying is, is that even though we may be wearing the name Christian, we do not yet possess the Spirit of Christ as we really should. And that ultimately is going to affect how we are seen by the community. It's going to affect the influence that we have, and it's going to limit the potential that we have to do good. People on the outside looking in are, are looking at the situation and thinking to themselves, why would I want to be a part of that group of people? And they cannot agree with one another. They cannot get along with one another. They, they, I, don't, I don't need that kind of division and disturbance in my own life. And I, I tell you, I, I would not uh, disagree with a person that felt that way. It shouldn't be that way. Evidently, there was a situation of this nature that is addressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Evidently, two folks in the church there uh, who were engaging in this sort of dispute. And uh, in that text, the Bible says, beginning in verse 5, I speak to your shame. Uh, in other words, you, you should be embarrassed and ashamed by the way you are portraying yourself to the, to the community around you. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? You belong to Christian people. Is there not anyone who could talk to you and help you to settle this dispute without, without having to do it in front of the world? Um, it says, No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brother, but brother goeth the law with brother, and that before unbelievers. That's why this was such a serious issue. Unbelievers were seeing it, and they were being negatively influenced by what they were seeing. Verse 7 says, Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do you not take the wrong? Why do you not suffer, your, or rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Here Paul says that if, even if I've lost something, I may have lost money or, or whatever it may be, wouldn't it be better for me to lose that than for the church to lose its good influence? So Luke 17 tells us that if we've been wronged by someone, we have a right to go to them one-on-one -on -one and uh, to address that and hope that they will respond in repentance and forgiveness. And we should do that and, and uh, have every right to do so. But if we take that to court and we, we air out this dirty laundry, so to speak, in front of the world, and that's going to negatively influence the church, and we certainly don't want that. Thank you for this question. Thank you. We've reached the halfway point of our program today, and we want to offer to you a free tract. Our tract today is entitled, The New Birth. If you'd like to have this tract or our free eight-lesson Bible correspondence course, or both, all of our materials are absolutely free on a Bible answer, or if you'd like to send us your question, just contact us. You may do that by writing us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net 
or you may call our toll-free number 1-800-436-0463. You can also contact us by means of our webpage, www.abibleanswertv.com. We have a contact page there. We have a page that shows the origin of a Bible answer, a little bit about our history. We have a memorial page, and we also have a page that gives the scripts that we've covered and uh, a link to our YouTube channel where you may watch past programs of a Bible answer. So please go to our website and avail yourself of what is there. Our next question now to Brother Brewer. What or who is the perfect in 1 Corinthians 13.10? Brother Brewer. Well, there's really two parts to this question. Uh, first is, is it a what or who? And then uh, if it's a what, then what is it? And if it's a who, then who is it? And so let's, uh, let's take the, these two questions one at a time. Uh, number one, is this which is perfect a what or who? And I believe pretty easily we can come to the conclusion that in the passage, Paul is clearly referring to this which is perfect as a what. Uh, when you actually read the verse, see in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 10, that Paul says, when that which is perfect is come. Uh, the, the way he words that verse is indicative of a who. Uh, is not indicative of a who instead, I, I, I mean. It is indicative of a what. Uh, if, it was, if it was indicative of a who, then Paul would have said, when he who is perfect is come. But that's just simply not what he said. So contextually, we can already tell that Paul is referring to a thing and not to a person. And that means that the most probably widely assumed understanding of this passage is that Paul is saying that these things are going to be present until... He who is perfect, which would be Jesus, has come back. And that's just not what he's saying. Uh, he's not referring to a who. He's referring to a what, a thing. Uh, so with that in mind, because we know uh, the idea that Paul is trying to present that he's talking about something instead of someone who is perfect coming, then we can move into the second part of the question is, since that which is perfect is a what, then, then what is it? Uh, to answer that question, let's go back and just kind of give an idea of what Paul is trying to accomplish in this chapter. And in this chapter, verses 1 through 7, what Paul does is he speaks of the supremacy of love to all of those miraculous gifts that the people uh, had coveted after so much that he had discussed in chapter 12 and following, that love was supreme to them all. Uh, and then he goes on in verse 8, uh, to talk about how that even though love never fails, that whether there be prophecies, they shall be done away, whether there be tongues, they shall cease, and whether there shall be knowledge, it will be done away. Uh, and so these were all miraculous gifts. The prophecies, the, the tongues, the knowledge, they were miraculous gifts. They were miraculous prophecies, miraculous tongues and miraculous knowledge. They were those spiritual gifts that he had just spent chapter 12 talking about, those people coveting and, and exalting themselves over. Uh, and he says that that miraculous knowledge was necessary because at that time they only had partial access to God's revealed truth. Um, the, the, the Word of God was not completed in a full form yet. Uh, they didn't have Matthew through Revelation at their fingertips like we have today and have had for centuries. Uh, it, it, the, the, the Revelation wasn't even completed being given yet. There were, there were entire books of the Bible epistles that hadn't been written at this point yet. And so uh, up to that time, because they didn't have access to that completed, full, revealed truth, then God had given them access to miraculous knowledge and to miraculous powers that would confirm the truth that they spoke. But a time was coming, he says, when perfect knowledge would come. And when that perfect knowledge was come, then those miraculous gifts that were only in part would be done away. And so contextually, that which is perfect in 1 Corinthians 13 
was, uh, that was coming was that perfect knowledge that was contained in the completed revelation uh, as given by the inspiration of God. Uh, Matthew through Revelation, uh, to which they then could turn as the completed Word. And when that Word was completed, there was just simply no more need for those miraculous gifts that were again only provided in the first place to confirm truth, John 20, 30 and 31, because since we now have that completed Bible, that completed Word of God, then we have a self-confirming truth. Uh, all we have to do to prove that what we say is the truth is simply to go to the text and let the Bible speak for itself. So that which is perfect that was coming, and since time has come, was the perfect, complete, fully revealed Word of God. Uh, and thanks be to God for that. Thank you for that great question. Thank you, Brother Brewer. And now to Brother Peters. Please discuss the word faith and its different meanings. Are there different kinds of faith? Brother Peters. This is a very interesting question because when we think of how the world thinks of the word faith, many times we think of a leap in the dark. Uh, we might hear individuals say, well, just take a leap of faith. Uh, other times we hear individuals use faith as if they're just talking about the simple mental assertion that God is and that Jesus is. But what does the Bible say about faith? One way the Bible uses faith, uh, we find one example of this in Romans 1 in verse 5, which says, "...by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for His name." I want you to notice that little definite article there, that little word, the. When that word, the, is used, it's referring to something that's specific. This isn't something that's personal to me and personal to someone else or personal to someone else in multiple faiths. It's a specific faith. Now ask ourselves, we have to ask ourselves, how do we become a partaker of God's grace? Well, it's through obedience to God's Word. We have to do what He says to do. And this is what Paul is specifying here. He is using faith to refer to the gospel system of faith. If I want to be pleasing to God, if I want to be a partaker of His grace, that great sacrifice that was made on our behalf, then I have to obey the gospel system of faith. So that's one way the word faith is used in Scripture. A second way we find in Hebrews chapter 11. Many times we call this the hall of faith. And in this we see individuals uh, talking about their faith and how their faith motivated them to action. And among this chapter in verse 6, Paul says, But without faith it is impossible to please God. So this kind of faith that is being exemplified is necessary for me to be pleasing to God. Well, what kind of faith is it? Is it just a mental assertion? Do I simply just in my mind say I believe? Well, each one of these men, beginning with Abel, then to Noah, then to Abraham, to Isaac, Moses, and all throughout this chapter have one thing in common. They heard commands from God. They trusted in what God had to say and then it motivated them to action. So faith here isn't just a mental assertion, but it's a trust that God means what He says and says what He means. And because I trust in God and His Word and in His promises, that motivates me to obedience, to action. But then we find another way the term faith is used in Scripture, and this is a very specific way, found in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And then again in Romans chapter 14. And Paul here is speaking of optional things. Uh, things that are not necessarily doctrinal, but things that are of opinion. Specifically about altar meat. Now this particular kind of meat was used in the offering to idols. And they would discount this meat in the market. It was more affordable. But there were some at this time who just, it went against their conscience to be a partaker of it. They didn't think it was right. And there were others who had no problem with it, and it was causing some friction. And Paul basically says, hey, meat is meat, but we don't want to offend our weaker brethren. And so the stronger brethren have a responsibility not to shove it in their face, 
But then he says in Romans 14, along these same lines, something about something toward the weaker brethren. In verse 22, he says, Hast thou faith? Well, have it to thyself before God. You have this kind of opinion? Keep it to yourself. Keep it between you and God. And here, this faith, well, this is referring to our scruples, our opinions about things based on our understanding of Scripture. Not doctrinal things, but things of conscience. So those are three ways the word faith is used in Scripture. And I hope this answers your question. Thank you. And now to Brother Arnold. How much time elapsed between the first two verses of Genesis 1? Brother Arnold. In Genesis 1, 1 and 2, the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, it was good. God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Now I wanted to read all the way down to verse 5 to indicate that if you're just taking the text at face value, which we should in this case, and you'll understand that everything in those first five verses is the first day of creation. And just in case there's any confusion as to what Moses meant by a day, because that word can sometimes be used in a, a figurative fashion, uh, Moses specifies an evening and a morning. That was the first day, 24 hours just as we know it today. So that, f that entire first day is encompassed by these verses in which God created everything, but at first it was, it was in darkness and it was, with, it was without form, but the Spirit of God began to work to bring form to what was formless so that life could exist on this earth that God had just created. In order to find more time in this, between these two verses, one has to read into it something that's just not there. The text just does not indicate that this was anything more than the first day. The only reason that I can assume why anyone would even want to do that is if they're trying to find support for the idea that's called theistic evolution. In other words, it's the idea that, God, that the world came into existence through the process of evolution that ultimately began with God. God created the world through the process of, of evolution. It's, if the theory of evolution will even seem plausible, it demands that there be millions and billions of years of time for this process to work. Now that obviously creates a difficulty for someone who wants to believe in God and the theory of evolution because the biblical account just does not allow for this amount of time. Uh, according to the biblical account, the earth is probably somewhere in the range of about 6,000 years old. Obviously that's a vast difference between uh, this concept and the concept of evolution. So if, if you're wanting to try to believe in both, you, you have to try to find a place where you can insert some time into Scripture. One effort that's been made in order to try to do that is a theory called the gap theory. And according to this theory, there was a gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And that, uh, that in that gap, what happened was that God had created a race even before Adam and Eve were created. In other words, there was a whole civilization of people that lived even before this time and that that civilization might have carried on for even millions of years. But that there was a great rebellion led by Satan and because of that, that rebellion, uh, Satan and, and those angels who followed in him were cast out of, that, out of heaven and as they were cast out, there was a great cataclysm, so to speak, on earth that destroyed all of that pre adamic race. And so that what you're reading in Genesis 1 is not the original creation, but it is instead a sort of a recreation where God remakes the, uh, the fallen uh, civilization that He had once created. So they suggest that there could be millions, if not billions of years in between Genesis 1 and Genesis 1-1 uh, and Genesis 1-2. One verse that is often uh, also thrown out there to try to support this concept is Genesis 2-3 where it says, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it 
because in it he rested from all his work which he created and made. Particularly there is an emphasis upon the expression created and made. And it is suggested that the word created pertains to the original creation, the pre-Adamic race, and the word made refers to what God did in remaking or recreating the race. But again, uh, this is an example of reading into the text something that's just simply not there. In Genesis 1 and verse 26 and 27, the Bible says that God said, Let us make, there's the word make, man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created, there's the word created, man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Notice how the words uh, create and make are used interchangeably in that context. They do not refer to two separate acts of creation, but all to the same act. So it is a stretch to say that the word make here pertains to God remaking something that already existed. The fact of the matter is there are other scriptures that indicate plainly God created this world through the process of, crea of, of, of miraculous creation. Everything was created full grown. It did not take uh, millions of years for it to evolve and develop. It was created for life immediately. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11, the Sabbath day practice of, of uh, old, the Old Testament people was based off of the creation week. In six days, the Lord made the earth and everything in it, Exodus 20, 11. Over in Matthew chapter 19, uh, there is also a reference. It's made in the context of marriage, but per pertains to this subject. Uh, in the beginning in Matthew 19, 5, Jesus said, uh, actually, let me back up to verse 4. It says, Have you not read that He which made them at the beginning made them male and female? For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. That's a quote from Genesis 2, 24, but it is said that it, that happened at the beginning. Well, if there's a million year gap in between those verses, then creating Adam and Eve wouldn't have been at the beginning, but the Bible says that it was. So the fact is there really is no gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 2. Thank you for this question. We're grateful to each of these brethren for doing such a good job today in uh, the answer of these questions. Some of them have been difficult, but we appreciate the good answers they have given. The Bible is God's answer book, and they have given answers from His Word. Remember, friends, that for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you would like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.